Hi, I just wanted to do a short video on whether or not a spark road or an EDM machine is a useful addition to a small workshop. Um, they're not hugely expensive if you pick up a second hand machine, a small second hand machine of a good uh, reliable brand. Um, you can CNC an electrode at copper for example or graphite and um, could be two or a 3D electrode and you can use that electrode to burn a cavity or a pocket into steel or aluminium or even hardened steel. You can machine a core up um, that may be two or 3D shape and then a very slightly smaller uh, NC code to produce an electrode that um, allows for the spark gap. The spark gap is um, depending on the settings approximately three or four thou, two to four thou depending on the settings and um, so you need to allow for that. So that will cut your cavity. It doesn't take too long the process. This is just a very basic intro into a spark eroder. And then once your cavity is cut you conveniently have, and, and this is particularly suitable when you've got a shape that doesn't CNC machine very easily. Okay, so this is just fitting the core in now. So if, if the, the core or the cavity or the pocket has got square corners, sharp edges that are difficult to CNC, or if it's made out of a material that is... Um, Hardened steel, again difficult to see and see, is a real application for a spark eroder. Obviously the electrode has to be set up very accurately in order to do precision work. Typically you clock up the electrode parallel with the X, Y axis and um, level with the work. And um, there's often very convenient adjusting screws um, in, in the head of the machine to allow you to tilt the electrode in all directions and rotate it to quickly set it up parallel and true. And then once that's done, that's the first stage. No, the first stage is to set your work up typically, then set your electrode up, um, and then um, set the two together using a digital readout and when, when the electrode makes contact with the work, it makes electrical contact and a little beeper goes off. Uh, you can also use feeler gauges and um, you can set the electrode to the work within probably easily within half a thousandth of an inch or a hundredth of a millimeter and spark to those sort of tolerances with a bit of care. So in this way of setting the work and the electrode and some reference point on the work to the electrode, for example this parallel which is on two datum surfaces which comes in contact with the edge of the electrode. You set your digital readout on zero and index over. You can cut matching pockets and cavities on moulds and tools and so on that are exactly aligned or very very close to exactly aligned. Of course it's not all beer and skittles spark eroding. It wouldn't be fair to just point out the good points. Um, you need to flush the electrode between the electrode and the work in order to clear out the eroded particles if you like the soot and um, It's pretty messy. It's a type of the dielectric fluid is a type of deodorized kerosene with a high flash point, a type of transformer oil. You can set the depth of cut. Let's put it here on 0.1 of a millimeter just to get this started. see from the bubbles of um, gas coming out of the electric fluid just where it's cutting, or well, you get a fair clue anyway, and that helps with a final check. Um, 
of the location of the electrode and whether it's cutting where you want it to cut or where you expect it to cut. One of the big difficulties with spark eroding is the particles of burnt off material, the soot if you like, gets caught between the electrode and the work and shorts out the current and stops or, or uh, poor, uh, badly affects the processing um, and so the, the smooth spark eroding process becomes very erratic and problematic and this can take up hours uh, to resolve sometimes if you don't have a good understanding of how to correct that spark eroding problem. Now it's starting to bog down for example and I can give it a bit more flush, I can lift it up, put a bit more flushing on it. Too much flushing will cause undesired wear of the electrode. Um, so it's a matter of just learning where the correct settings are. Just making some adjustments here now on the talk. I can hear that it's not cutting particularly well, and so I'm just making some adjustments. For example, there's a small amount of soot jamming out in a particular point and arcing out, and um, sometimes it's just a matter of lifting the electrode and brushing it clean and settling it back down again until it's eroding over a bigger area and the flushing balance between the removal of soot and the cutting process settles and then you're away again. Other times it's much more problematic and you can spend a long time trying to get the eroding process to work as, as you want it to. On this job I'm only removing about half a millimetre of metal and so I can have the settings set fairly conservatively. I'm on six amps and about 50 to 100 volts and um, the spark has a millisecond on time and a millisecond off time as the myriads of little sparks are discharged. In addition to that the whole electrode is moving up and down to allow the work, sorry to allow the uh, particles of soot to wash out. the action here. I'll just speed it up a little so it'll flush better. So it's retracting about half a millimeter and cutting for one or two seconds. That's a typical sort of situation which allows the cutting action to breathe for the particles of soot to get out and the process to go smoothly and automatically. And in this situation you can let it run, sometimes for hours. If it's a deep cavity it may run all day. Looking at it you might think that flushing is excessive. And it would be if it was applied directly into the spark gap, as is sometimes needed. But in this case it's just an external jet of fluid. And when the electrode gets down to within the sparking depth of about 2 to 4 thou, the, um, the flow of the fluid is cut off almost completely and because the gap is so tiny and it's just a passive flow from outside of the electrode so in that situation um, you do need a fairly strong flow but it's actually flowing very slowly when the electrode is doing its eroding it may get a little burst of flushing when the electrode lifts so what do these machines cost? Well, just transferring the New Zealand currency into US dollars is probably the most useful. The Taiwanese have been specializing in making reliable, low-cost EDM machines 
for the last 20 or 30 years, there's probably um, 40 or 50 different manufacturers in Taiwan all competing for the market. Um, I would imagine a small machine like this would cost new in US dollars ten to fifteen thousand uh, dollars for a basic machine. More than that for a bigger, more sophisticated machine. Um, so you can see a machine like that that's maybe ten years old and hasn't had a lot of use in the industry. Um, you could pick up for uh, quite quite a low price, you know, just a couple of thousand dollars if you're lucky. Of course, buying a low-cost machine uh, is a bit of a two-edged sword if it's an unreliable make. Um, they're very complicated. There's 10 or 20 big circuit boards full of chips, and if you don't have an electronics expert friend that can troubleshoot these type of machines, you could very quickly spend many more thousands of dollars getting it running reliably and keeping it running reliably. I'm just doing a little check here depth mic of the cavity or pocket depth um, before setting the final cut um, with a lower um, amperage and a higher voltage and a lower millisecond on time just to get a nice finish for the last cut. And just a final check before I take it out of the machine that it's the correct offset, it doesn't need tweaking just using an adjustable power law here for the lazy person slip gauge checking the offset from one pocket to the other and everything's fine <laughs>